Hello, YA and dystopian future fans, and welcome to episode 2 of Ruth Fox's Under the Heavens. I'm Abigail, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. Previously on Under the Heavens. The transfer of Earth's whales to New Eden is well underway, as the world watches Kim, I mean Hannah, captain the spaceship Saiki through the stars to their new home. But strange things are happening aboard the spaceship as Kim discovers that the blue whale, Adonai, has transferred his consciousness into a droid. Chapter 6 Normally, Kim would have stopped by the mess for her lunchtime meal, and then dinner, but today she skipped both of those. The computer insisted that she eat, so she took one of the emergency protein bars she had stashed in one of the pockets of her tool belt. They were as tasteless as cardboard, and she noticed it particularly now, after that glorious hot meal this morning. In the outer chambers of Deck 13, she checked out the force field generator as she'd promised the computer. The force fields worked in a similar manner to hollow projectors, with a stable field of protons cast into a predetermined shape and location from a singular source. The generator itself was only about as big as a milk crate, but the internal workings made Kim's hands itch. There was a lot of complex wiring, circuit boards, and quite a few things she had never seen before. Computer, she asked as she scrolled through the projected readout on the wall panel above the generator's alcove. How well is the generator running? My readings show it running at 93% efficiency. Is that number fluctuating at all? It has varied by 0.81% in the past week. This is within normal parameters. Kim crouched down, looking at the small device longingly. She had only a basic understanding of how force fields worked, and the basics had never been enough to please her on anything in life. But there was an urgency to her need to know, now. She had a reason to need the force field in the galley storeroom to stay at full. For who knew how long? With the force fields in the tanks active, she could end up blowing out the generator altogether. Computer, what do you know about force fields? The computer seemed pleased to be asked. Force fields are relatively new technology. The first charged particle-based force fields were first used for military purposes in 2026, during the Triad War. These force fields were mounted to fighter planes and were unreliable due to their massive power consumption. However, they provided a good testing ground for the capabilities of the technology. Over the next decade, the technology was refined to the point that the charge could be projected up to several miles away, provided relay stations were set in place to conduct the energy from the generator. Seiki was only the third ship to use this technology internally rather than as external shielding. While force fields have been used in civilian households and businesses for many years as security and safety features, Seiki's scale is somewhat grander. Two other near-horizon ships, the Tanoshige and the Nichiyobi, are also equipped with similar technology. This was interesting, but nothing Kim didn't already know. Kim looked back at the readouts, as she'd expected, and the computer had confirmed. There was nothing to be concerned about. At least, not for now. Kim left Deck 13 and walked back to the ramps. At the very least, she consoled herself, she now had an explanation for the strange things she'd seen. The man on the ramp, her bedsheets being tucked back though God knew why he'd snuck into her room to undertake house cleaning. But something about that troubled her, too. The door to her room had been stuck open when she came back in. She had put it down to a malfunction. And yes, that might have been the case. And Adonai had merely taken advantage of the situation. That would have meant he'd have to have happened by whilst she was conveniently in the shower. He couldn't have known not without access to the computer where she was in that room, which meant he'd come, fixed the bed, then left before she'd emerged from the bathroom. 
Something about that explanation seemed a little unsatisfactory, however. That was one possibility. The other was that he'd opened the door himself. The problem was that if the computer didn't recognize him, how could he have done that? The sensors were tied to the computer rather than the ship's autonomous systems. Due to the need for voice activation and life support control in times of emergency, there were overrides, but again he couldn't have activated them without speaking to the computer. He'd been lurking on the ship for less than a day. How much could he have learned during that time, simply from observing her? She'd noticed improvements in his speech from when he'd been in his whale body. Had he been watching as she contacted Edward? It was possible. There were independent video links to each of the main rooms on each deck. He could have tapped into them from any display unit at any control junction. Tectroids had that option. So did anything else that had fingers that could scroll and tap any holographic displays. Kim's thoughts ground to a sudden halt. She'd just rounded a particularly wide stanchion, giving her a view across the other ramps, through the shadowed gloom. She wasn't imagining things, was she? Not this time. Hey! She called out, reaching for her tool belt. She swiftly pulled out a flashlight. Activated by her tightening grip, the beam stabbed downwards onto the ramp that crossed below hers. And she saw it, just for a second. But she saw it, she was sure. The figure of a man, darting for an open doorway at one of the landings. Her shout echoed back at her as she broke into a run. She reached the railing and didn't hesitate. She vaulted over, the muscles of her arms and legs remembering the motion and sending her sailing through the air. And though it had been over a year since she'd run like this, the lower gravity aided her adroitness. She landed in a crouch, one hand coming down between her bent knees, the flashlight still clasped in her other. She flashed it toward the door, which led onto deck twelve. She couldn't see him anymore, but she charged for the doorway, flinging herself through. Hey! She shouted, anger making her words hard as stones. Get back here! Something held her back from saying his name, from calling to Adonai. How had he gotten free? It was impossible. She'd only just been checking the generator, and it had showed no sign of failure or fluctuation, but he had gotten free. And now he was on the loose in her ship, and who knew what his plans were? She skidded to a stop. She'd come in from the opposite direction than usual, at the far end of the arcing loop of walkways between the tanks. It was now late evening, and the sea was darkening as the halogen lights far overhead dimmed to their night phase. The glowing blue of the aquarium was becoming a dull gray, only the occasional shimmer of a force field adding to the glow of the halogens that were tuned to her movements. She glanced to the left, then right, seeing nothing and no one. She looked up, but the catwalks were empty. A bridge of one of the tanks arched overhead, a tunnel big enough to fit the largest whale's bulk, with room to spare. She flashed her flashlight over the glass, and a sleepy rumble resonated through the link telling her she'd disturbed at least one whale's rest with her noise. The beam reflected its way into the depths of Deck 12, but it was clear that the halogens had been turning on overhead well ahead of her own position. With a grim smile, she followed them to the left, shining her flashlight up into the catwalks. Come back here, she called again. I'm not angry. I'm sorry if I sounded that way. You scared me, but you can't hide from me. I just want to talk to you. No reply. Strange. The Adonai she'd spoken to this morning had seemed happy to talk. Why was he hiding now? Was it because she'd locked him up? I'm sorry I had to confine you, she said. I told you my reasons, and you said you understood. Well... I understand you too. I know it may seem harsh. Kim. The computer spoke. The voice startled her so much she jumped, her feet skittering on the decking. 
She pressed a hand to her chest, heart pounding. You are yet again talking to yourself. At least I can detect no activation of your link, which suggests you are not inwardly directing your speech in the manner required to speak to the whales. Is this analysis correct? Yeah, I know, she said. Shut up for now, okay? She lifted the flashlight, tracing one of the catwalks with the beam. Nothing. Wait, no. Tell me when the force field in the galley storeroom failed. The force field in the galley storeroom is still active, the computer replied. Kim, it is almost time for your report to Edgeward Station. The force field's still active? In its entirety? No gaps? Yes, Kim. Kim cursed and lowered the flashlight beam. As her breathing slowed and the pounding in her ears faded, she could hear only the monotonous sound of the engines and the thrumming of the aquarium machinery. She could wake the whales, she realized. She could ask them if they'd seen anyone come in, and if so, where he had gone. But she was reluctant to do that. The whales didn't pay much attention to anything outside the tanks anyway. They only cared about her because of the link, and even then their attention was patchy. Except for Adonai's, of course. Was the computer getting false readings? Could Adonai have fed it untrue data? That would be a complex task, one even Kim would struggle with. Well, there was one way to find out. She could go back to Deck 5 and check the force field. She made her way back to the ramp and shone her flashlight into every recess it could reach, cross-sectioning the vast area. To no avail. There was no hint of movement, nothing to say there was anyone down here but herself. She quickened her step, almost running back to Deck 5. She was sure that she'd find the bulkhead ripped apart, a service hatch popped open. But the hallway was clear, the wall intact. She stopped in front of the door to the storeroom. Adonai stood in the middle, shoulders slumped, head tilted forward. He looked exactly as he had when she left him. A chill washed over Kim, starting at her head and reaching out from her toes. Adonai, she said. Have you left this room? Adonai looked at his head, seeming to come back to life. Kim could hear the soft whine of servos as motors powered back up. No, Kim, he said. I have stayed here, as you asked. Could he be lying? It was possible. But she didn't think so. He'd have to have moved very quickly and get himself back here before she'd arrived. That, in addition to having deactivated and reactivated the force field without the computer's knowledge. Besides which, Adonai had never lied to her. Kim glanced aside, trying to get control of herself. It wasn't like her to be so jumpy, to feel so much fear. Adrenaline was coursing through her veins and she felt wide awake, ready to run, to fight. But there was nothing to fight, except her own mind. Adonai, she said. You said you'd been in the droid for less than a day before I found you. Are you certain? The droid tells me that it has been active for 21 hours. Adonai replied. There is a battery life indicator that reads across the top left of my vision. That is what it says. Again, it could be a lie. But Kim didn't think so. God, her head hurt. She lifted a hand and wiped her forehead. Cold sweat smeared across her wrist. Then it couldn't have been you, Kim said. What could not have been me? I saw a man. She replied, her voice dropping to a whisper. Perhaps a woman, I'm not sure now. On the ramps. He was watching me on the day I came down to see you. The day we had the conversation about me going outside the ship, and you said you dreamt about the stars. I was at that stage working on my plan to download my mind, Adonai said. I did not yet know if I could do it. It wasn't you, Kim repeated more softly. She glanced around her, 
unable to stop herself. It was as if her body expected the figure to be there, lurking in the corridor, having followed her up from deck 12, where she now realized she'd lost him. Or her. I will stay here as long as you like, Kim, Adonai said. I will stay here forever if that's what you ask. Kim nodded vaguely and moved away from the door. Kim, it is now time to begin your shipwide analysis, the computer reminded her. Please report to deck one immediately. Coming, Kim said, before turning back to Adonai. She wanted to say something, but her mouth hung open. No sound coming out. I am going crazy. Chapter 7 Kim made her way up to deck one, feeling off balance and unsure of everything except one fact. She couldn't let word of this reach Captain Mbewe. The Admiral would be on the lookout for any signs of strain or psychosis, especially if the computer sent out the counseling request as it had said it would. If one, even one tiny little thing slipped through, command of Seiki would be taken from her. They'd send out ships, or maybe even slave Seiki to their own systems to guide her into dock. Someone else would take over for the remaining 71 days it would take to reach New Eden. And worst of all, she'd have failed in her mission. Not the mission Near Horizon had assigned to her, but her real purpose on board Seiki. As a crusader operative, She'd be a traitor to the cause. The Crusaders would have her killed before she could be put on trial, before she could be interrogated, before she could reveal their names and faces. What would Zane say when he found out? He would hate her. He'd think she was weak. He was Martian, driven, intense in emotion and determination. He'd wish he'd never kissed a stupid girl like her. God! She muttered to herself as the maglift continued upwards. I'd be better off killing myself. Kim, I must also remind you of the need to take your mental health evaluation. The computer chimed in. Shut up, shut up, shut up! Kim pounded her fists on the maglift wall, the stainless steel answering with a mere metallic clong. I don't need this right now! The computer mercifully, was silent. Kim stepped onto the bridge. She straightened her jumpsuit, then took a deep breath and began the routine, moving from console to console, letting the monotony of the familiar task take over her mind so she didn't have to think. When the time came for her to contact with Edgeward, she felt a good deal calmer. She faced the hollow projection of the man's grayed-out face with a cool expression. Anything to report? The Admiral asked. Was he looking at her more closely than usual? Kim wasn't sure how much of her pallor showed on his hollow projection of her. His own flickered on and off momentarily before stabilizing, ashen-toned, his eyes still as intense as ever. Nothing unusual, sir. I'm sending through the data packets now. Please, she thought. Let that be it. Sign off now, before I say something wrong. Ms. Monksman, Admiral Mbewe added after a second's pause. Kim shifted on her feet, then forced herself to stand still. Don't show your guilt. It was the first rule Constantine had ever taught her. Yes, sir? You're doing extremely well with this task. I'm impressed, given your age. Keep up the good work, eh? Kim felt only shock. Not once in 93 days had Admiral Mbewe offered a word of praise. She should have been pleased, but instead she felt suspicious. Why now? Had he noticed something in her reports? In her face? He must have seen the request for counseling that the computer had made. It would have been blinking red at the top of the transmission. So why the encouragement, and not a reprimand? Thank you, sir, 
she said, but he'd already terminated the communication link. Kim was left staring into empty air. Kim, you are again exhibiting signs of anxiety, the computer said. Kim's fingers were clenched on the back of one of the chairs, she realized. She'd been holding it in a grip so hard she'd ripped through the polyester, exposing a small half-moon of yellow padding. I'm fine, she said. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed, computer. Thankfully, the computer offered no protest. Chapter 8 The alarm was blaring. It had intruded on Kim's dream, and she had the feeling it had been going off for quite some time before she'd awoken. Drowsily, she rubbed her eyes and sat up. And then everything crashed in on her. It had been three days since she'd found Adonai in the mess. She'd been avoiding the storeroom since, even taking the mag lift to deck four, walking along, and taking a service hatch down to approach the mess from the opposite end of the hallway, so she didn't have to pass the door and see him inside. She knew he still hadn't moved. After her scare the other day, she'd called up camera footage of the storeroom and found no sign of tampering on the video that showed him standing, slightly slumped, in the center of the room, unmoving, for hours and hours. She dressed mechanically, deliberately avoiding looking in the mirror. She couldn't face her own face today. It was as she was pulling on her boots that the computer chimed. I have an incoming transmission from Edgeward Station. Kim's mouth went dry. Oh, crap. She reached up to smooth her hair before remembering she didn't have any. Her fingers touched the smooth skin of her scalp instead, feeling the faint ridged lines of the link. Okay, just a second. I'll be up on deck one in two minutes. She straightened the collar of her jumpsuit and hoped she'd managed to wash the sleep from her eyes before she exited the room quickly and hurried for the mag lift. Her heart was pounding in her ears. What could this be about? Had something happened? Had one of her reports been brought up as suspicious? Or had the Admiral somehow gotten wind of what had happened with Adonai? Damn it, was she about to lose everything? She strode onto deck one and pulled out the chair behind the comm desk to sit. The droids whirring in the background made her feel less alone, at least, as she drew the kanji for talk on the back of her hand. This is Hannah Monksman, she said, pleased that her voice sounded steady. Hannah, hi. A woman's face shimmered into three dimensions ahead of her. She had blonde hair that was cut severely short, but her eyes were kind. I'm Mona White. I'm the counselor aboard Edgeward Station. Kim felt an unpleasant mixture of relief and panic. She had hoped the Admiral would ignore the computer's request, hoped that she'd get away with it, at least for now. But no, she'd had it too easy the past few months. Being alone on the ship, she'd been able to keep to herself the majority of the time. It had been so nice not to have to pretend to only have to deal with the reports to the captain and her stupid transmission for the art project fans back on Earth. Now she'd have to wend her way through another web of lies. No, no, don't feel bad, the woman said. I can see it on your face. Hannah, this isn't the end of the world. God knows I've counseled 70% of the people on this station at least once. It's why I'm out here. Kim nodded. I don't think I really need counseling, she ventured. That's usually a sure sign that you do. Look, we all think we're strong and capable, and most of the time, we are. But you're a young woman, and you've got a huge responsibility. I was chosen for this, Kim reminded her. The woman held up a hand, which came into view just below her chin. Yes, yes, I know. But life in space is hard to deal with and all the training in the world doesn't help humans adapt to an environment we weren't born in and can't navigate without assistance. Kim kept her mouth shut. Inside, she was fuming. She had been trained for this. She knew what she was getting into, and damn it, she could do this. 
if people would just leave her alone. She heard a clamoring voice in her mind. Kim, 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 it's all right. A rush of love and affection enveloped her, and the sharp edges of panic were rubbed away. Be calm, be still. She let the calm wash over her, feeling guilty. Her anger had been creeping outwards and had resonated through the link. It was Levi and Hosea channeling this new strength into her, this serenity. For an instant, she was with them, floating in the blue-black depths, weightless and content. I know it's early in the morning for you, so I won't keep you too long. I'm sure you've got lots to do. So today, we'll just go through the preliminaries. Have you been feeling lonely? No, Kim replied instinctively. Then, rethinking it, she said, Yes. If she could keep the woman's focus on feelings of loneliness, she could avoid her probing too deeply about things Kim could not talk about, namely a rogue whale and an imprisoned tech droid. Not all the time. There's the... The link, of course. The whales. But they're not real company, are they? No, Kim said, while thinking, God, they are. So that's a good start. Acknowledging issues is the first step toward fixing them. Let me ask you this. Do you miss your colleagues? Kim almost spluttered. You mean Ren and Yoshi? And perhaps even Abdiel, Mona said with a nod. No, they weren't my colleagues. They were... You still socialized almost exclusively with them for the better part of a year. It would be normal to feel some connection. Kim nodded slowly, trying to think of the right thing to say. I miss Abdiel. He was nice. Mona continued to nod. Of course. He was the favorite of a lot of people. Many had him picked to win on personality alone. She didn't want to hear about it. What had happened to Abdiel was a shame, and she always felt a spike of anger when she thought on it too long. And I miss Wren. A little. Of course. There were many pictures of you two together. We weren't together, Kim said immediately. She waited a beat. But Mona said nothing, so she added, I don't miss Yoshi. Mona laughed. I imagine not. She was your closest competitor. She's just not a nice person. The words sounded childish, true as they were. Yoshi had been belligerent from the moment Kim had first met her and had gone out of her way to make Kim into an enemy. Her following mostly consisted of people who thought the project should be under control of a science agency rather than near Horizon. They'd still been a large portion, if the stats on Daywatch were to be believed. We can talk more on that subject later, Mona promised. Now, the computer reported that you've begun talking to yourself. This isn't uncommon, and it's not alarming or dangerous. What it is, is your brain working in a perfectly ordinary way. You're used to having input from others, speaking to others, taking calm calls, watching hollow video, or just hearing pedestrians on the path outside your house. Her voice was nice, Kim thought. She had an accent. What was it? Finnish? Or Norwegian? Something European. Talking to yourself fills that void when you're alone, and it's another form of input that helps you make sense of your surroundings. I could go on, but for now, we won't class it as anything to worry about. The loneliness, however, is something I'd like to speak to you about. While not concerning in itself, it can lead to more damaging trains of thought or behavior patterns. Right, Kim said. She wanted to tell the woman that she wasn't lonely. She had the whales with her at all times. And there were her talks with Zane, which, of course, she couldn't mention. She bit her tongue. Now, you haven't been having any hallucinations, have you? No, Kim replied, careful not to answer too quickly. Mona didn't bat an eyelid. Damn, she couldn't read this woman at all. 
Was she buying Kim's lies? She was supposed to be a trained psychologist, supposed to be able to tell when people weren't being truthful. Wasn't she? Maybe not. Perhaps Kim had seen too many Holovision dramas, where the psychologist uncovers deep-seated fears and reveals them like a poker dealer turning playing cards face up. Perhaps she was remembering how it felt to be inside a cell in the police station, trying to convince a detective sergeant she hadn't been in the area, she hadn't been taking stims, she didn't know anything about the drugs, the stolen air car, the high-speed chase the night before. That's good. Given your psychological profile, you seem very capable. But I want you to keep an eye out for things of this nature, okay? Anything that seems out of the ordinary. Your mind playing tricks on you. Strange things happening with your vision. Or unexpected moods or sensations. Or hearing voices that aren't there, okay? Mona smiled. Difficult in your case, I know. The link is quantum tech, relatively new and some of what it does still isn't fully understood. It can make it hard to sort out your own perceptions from those of the whales. But I used to work in a mental health institution, so I know how those things work. I wasn't linked myself, but some of my colleagues were. It was often tough for them to sort through the information coming through from their patients. Yes, I know. But it's different with the whales, Kim said fervently, wanting Mona to understand. It was different. The link, the whales, they weren't a burden. They were something beautiful and wondrous. I don't mind it. It's like... She stopped, struggling to think. She fell back on what she'd told the Art Project fans during her last transmission. It's like being a friend. Only your friends are in the next room and you can wave at them through a window. You know they'll still be there even though you can't touch them. Another rush. This time, a burst of bubbling gratitude and thankfulness. Some of the whales had sensed what she'd said and had responded in kind. That's lovely, Mona said, and she sounded like she meant it. I think that's enough for today. Get some breakfast and start your day, okay, Hannah? I'll speak to you again next week. Okay, Kim said as she signed off leaning back in her chair. God. Well, it seemed she'd passed that test, at least. She found herself shaking a little from the adrenaline. But it was exhilaration, she felt, not fear, as she left deck one. That soaring feeling, the conviction that everything was going to work out after all, was what took her back to deck five. Not to breakfast, as Mona had suggested, but to look into the storeroom next to the mess. Adonai was still there, just as she'd left him. She couldn't tell if it was the droid's sensors or the whale's senses that alerted him to her arrival. But he lifted his head, fixing her with those golden orbs. Hello, little one with long fins, he said. Have you come to let me out? Kim looked at him evenly. I still can't do that, Adonai. You know that. No, I don't. He sounded a bit like a sulky child who'd been sent to the naughty corner. I don't like it in here, Kim. I did what I did because I wanted to see and experience things. I know, Kim replied. His tone touched her much more deeply than she'd have liked. Look, I'm sorry this is the way it has to be. But it's for your own safety as well as the safety of the ship. No, it's not. Those eyes bore into hers, unblinking, unwavering, refusing to let her off the hook. His speech was improving with every sentence, Kim noted. It was making it hard to think of him as a whale. You're a caretaker, little one. You're supposed to look after me. You're not the only whale aboard this ship, she explained. And I can't put you above any of the others. Or myself. If Seiki fails, we'll all die. Why do you think I would hurt the ship? Adonai's voice was wounded. How was that possible? The tech droid's vocal processors weren't made to carry inflection. They were only meant to relay basic information as quickly as possible. 
She'd never even heard one speak in a full sentence to her before now. It might not be intentional, she told him, but you don't know how things work here. I found you in the galley cooking food, Adonai. You might just as easily have activated a control junction and shut down the engines, or life support, or the aeration controls for the tanks. I wouldn't do that, he replied stubbornly. Kim sighed. Look, I don't know that, okay? I can't see the future. I can't know that you won't get curious or try to do something to help and access the wrong system. Besides which, Adonai, do you have any idea what would happen if anyone knew what you've done? Adonai lifted his head. No. What? Even I don't know. Kim spread her arms. It's never been done before. No one even thought it was possible. The link was made to translate for you so that a human being could monitor your health and well-being and make sure you survived this journey. It was only proven that you could use it to speak with us about a year before the art project was finalized. That's four years after the whole project was approved for funding and had the green light to go ahead. It was purely accidental, and there are still things about that which can't be explained. Is it a mixture of the emotions and sensations you're feeling at the time that the human mind translates into words? Or is it an actual translation, like hearing Japanese and rearranging the words into an English sentence? The fact is, we don't know. Quantum tech is still too new. There are scientists on Earth right now still trying to figure that out. Adonai brightened, lifting his slumped shoulders and tilting his chin upwards. I could help them. No, Kim barked. She paced to the left, then the right. I'm sorry, Adonai, but you can't. They can't know about you. Why not? Do you always have to ask why? God! She stopped pacing and squared her own shoulders. All right. You want to know? This is it, Adonai. This is the truth. They'll scrap the mission. You'll go straight back to Earth. All the whales will. You'll live the rest of your lives in those tanks in Yokohama instead of the oceans of New Eden. That's if you're lucky. She met his gaze, trying to convey the seriousness of her statements. If you're not, they'll carve you up and see what makes you so special, Adonai. You're the only one, of all the whales, who managed to do this. They're going to find out how, and why you were able to. If that means giving you a lobotomy, taking out pieces of your brain while you're still alive and breathing, believe me, they'll do it. Adonai was silent. His golden eyes grew slightly dimmer. For a long time, he stood there, and Kim stood opposite him, separated only by the occasional ripple of blue force field energy. She felt bad. Terrible, in fact. Her heart felt knotted. She cared for Adonai, and she had only told him part of the truth. But it was a real truth. He had to know what kind of danger he was in. Near Horizon would not allow it. A full minute had passed before Adonai said this. Kim was about to leave, the weight of that day's duties pressing down on her. Near Horizon believes you're worth saving, Kim replied slowly. They do, but they won't be able to contain a secret like this. And honestly, I can't vouch for them either. They might have started out as a non-for-profit, but they're not any longer. They went into this as a commercial venture. That's what they do. Not that I blame them. The money to do things, even good things, has got to come from somewhere. They know how to get it. But what if they decide they can use the money you could bring in? An actual talking whale they could lock up in a tank and charge people to see. Could go toward re-terraforming Central America. Or cleaning up the atom bomb sites in Russia and the Middle East. Or could go toward curing one of the new cancers that have been found. Or toward funding a food production colony on Ganymede. Or exploring the Earth-like worlds in the Ephraim system. Or carrying refugees to Mars. Or Naphtali. Or God knows what other pies they've got their fingers in. I don't understand what pies are, Adonai said. Kim huffed. 
The point is, you'd be the one who pays the price. Even if they let the rest of the mission happen, you, Adonai, would be taken back to Earth. You'd live the rest of your life in a tank, if you were lucky. And I... Kim's voice finally broke, unexpectedly. I'd never be let near you again. She couldn't feel him in the link, not the way she could feel the others. But she saw this hit home. He looked aside, his gaze meeting the walls. I think I understand now, little one with long fins. Good. Don't forget it. The tightening in her throat made the harsh words even harsher. So you know now why you need to go back. Go back? He repeated the words as if testing them out. Go back where? To your body. This is my body. He stretched out his metallic arms, as if this proved it. I mean your body as a whale, she said impatiently. You have to transfer your consciousness back in there. He looked confused, as if that had never occurred to him. But I don't know how. This was what Kim was afraid of. Whatever you did to get yourself out, well, just do the opposite. I'm not sure I can. He sounded hesitant and slightly afraid. You do know how, Kim said firmly. Or you will. You spent time figuring this out, right? All you've got to do is rework the process. But it's different. The fear was growing stronger, and his body showed it through his fidgeting feet. It's very different. I was able to make it out because I understood the way the droid worked. I knew its language, and its functions, and there was a pathway to follow. The link. The link. Oh, God. Kim lifted a hand to her head. She could feel a headache starting, a tightening across her temples. Of course, Adonai's flesh and blood body had been connected to the link. Once he'd transferred himself through the computer and into the droid, he had no such connection to bridge the gap back to his body. The linking process was complicated, and while Kim had the tools and equipment to repair and fine-tune most errors with the link, she had no experience in installing one. And a droid, not having a brain, couldn't use a link anyway. You don't have the link anymore. He shook his head slowly. I admit I knew this would be the case. It didn't stop me. It should have, Kim burst out. Of all the stupid, stupid things to do, Adonai. Shamefaced, he looked away from her and shuffled his feet some more. His gestures and motions, they were so damn human. She didn't know how it was possible, since the droid itself had no programming in that area. Perhaps it was something that just came naturally, along with having arms and legs and an upright posture. Kim turned away, shaking her head. This was too much. She couldn't think on it any longer or she'd go insane. More insane than she already was. I'm going to do my work. It was all she could manage to say now. You'll come back, though? Adonai's voice was hopeful. Kim sighed. Yes, I suppose I'll have to. Chapter 9 Kim ate sparingly, another boring, tasteless soup made from powder, then strapped on her tool belt. She was scheduled to check on the fisheries, and this was Kim's least favorite of all tasks. The fisheries were accessed through a door between decks 9 and 10. She took the ramp to reach it, steeling herself against any possible visions of men or women. If she saw anything, she would ignore it, she decided. A mirage couldn't hurt her or the ship. But she saw nothing, of course. Scanning the depths with her flashlight, she breathed a sigh of relief. 
Perhaps Mona's session had helped her after all. And from now on, she'd have an uneventful journey. Well, save for the problem of Adonai. I cannot rouse Adonai. Hosea broke into her thoughts, as if reading her own mind. I know, Kim replied softly. He's just floating there. He stares, doesn't move, even when I dive right past him. And he won't talk to me through the link. He's never been like this. Adonai is... Kim thought this through, trying to come up with an explanation that wouldn't alarm Hosea, or give her any ideas of her own. Kim didn't think the southern right whale would be able to do what Adonai had. She didn't think she had the intellect Adonai had. But still, it had happened once, and that meant it could happen again. Kim did not want a ship populated by walking whales. He's ill. Ill? Hosea began to panic. Oh no, what if I catch it? What if we all catch it? It's not that kind of sickness, Kim said firmly. Oh crap, Hosea was broadcasting her feelings through the link, and the others were picking up on it. Kim began to feel fluctuations of fear in her own chest. She forced herself to calmness. The last thing she needed was to add the whale's anxiety to her own. You can't catch it. Are you sure? How can you be sure? Adonai is ill? Tobias asked. He doesn't smell ill. How can we help him? Should we sing to him? We should sing, we should sing. Fifteen will not get ill. Fifteen is healthy. Look at him swim. Bad things are happening. This is just one of them. This last thought was dark, accompanied by a deep bitterness. It was Hosea who thought this, Kim found as she traced the voice. She stopped walking and leaned against a wall as the feeling of dark, seething anger washed through her, but faded just as quickly. Hosea, she said. But Hosea refused to speak pushing herself down into the smallest space the link allowed, where Kim could only feel that she had not eaten well on her last meal and was hungry and agitated. Great, now she'd have to tune Hosea on top of everything else. Kim continued on her way. The fisheries were by necessity difficult to reach. Their delicate machinery was shrouded in protective layers of lead-lined bulkheads and their own airlock doors. The reason for this was that the entire success of the mission rested on not the whales, but the fish and the plankton. If the food source failed on the journey to New Eden, there would be no hope for the whales. They'd all perish of starvation before reaching the planet. Kim stopped in the alcove outside her chosen entrance. There were racks here, three protective white plastic jumpsuits hanging from coat hooks, and plastic boots made out of rubber. She pulled them on over her own jumpsuit and rebuckled her tool belt over the top, then keyed in the code to access the airlock. The keypad beeped at her, lighting up blue, and fighting a hiss of rushing air, she slipped inside as quickly as she could and allowed the door to clamp shut behind her. The space beyond was a small chamber. Please stand still while decontamination procedures are undertaken, the computer intoned. I've done this before, Kim grumbled, rolling her eyes. Around thirty times, actually. It never hurts to have a reminder, Kim. She stood still while more blue lights flashed, this time cleansing ultraviolet rays, wiping away every trace of external bacteria. To her right, another rack held face masks, and she pulled one over her nose and mouth then stepped through another door covered by hanging plastic flaps onto a metal walkway that ringed an enclosed circular pool of water. Unlike the water in the tanks, this didn't glow blue. It was a greenish color, because it wasn't exposed to the halogen lamps, and because of the algae that built up on the tank walls. The algae weren't harmful, and in fact were a food source for the fish. Their own waste products helped fertilize it, so unlike the whale's tanks, this was a self-sustaining system. 
Still, there were aspects that had to be monitored, and Kim made her way down a narrow set of stairs, skipping and sliding on the handrails out of habit rather than any need for speed. The inner ledge was a circle just below the level of the tank's top, which was sealed, just like the whale's tanks. It wouldn't do any good to have an open-topped tank if the gravity generator fritzed out. She walked around it to the junction station, which looked just like all the others on the ship. She could check the readings from deck one, of course, but it was better to get a visual of the dials and valves, which were the manual backup systems. Just in case. Control of the water quality was crucial for maintaining healthy fish. Fertilizing, clarifying, and adjusting the pH of the water made sure the fish could breed happily and healthily, and increase yields substantially. There was also a need to prevent eutrophication. When too many nutrients entered the water, or weren't consumed fast enough by the fish, and make sure oxygen levels stayed high. Fish would suffer from electrolyte stress and become ill if anything was out of balance. The tanks were shared with other marine life, copepod plankton, krill, and the thick mud at the bottom was a breeding ground for the mud-dwelling benthic amphipods. The fish was of various types, herring, sand lance, and capelin for the baleen whales, sturgeon fish, kelp fish, yellowtail, cardinal fish, or at least approximations of these species, since the original genetics had been somewhat muddied over the past few decades. Kim didn't like looking at the fish. Unlike the whales, these creatures were dull-eyed, lackluster things with trailing fins and a sense of awkward grace that spoke of what they'd once been, before the genetic tampering. She remembered her meal of sous-vide salmon on a bed of shiitake mushrooms, rocket, with a brown butter jus, which she'd eaten at a grand restaurant in Chicago when Abdiel had convinced her and Wren to leave their training for one night and have a good time. The way the grayish flesh had squished under her knife. She wasn't used to eating meat that didn't come from a can or on a burger bun, and on top of the brute, it made her stomach royal. She'd eaten enough to be polite, but neither Wren nor Abdiel seemed to notice or care that her $89 meal had been left in ragged tatters all around her plate. The fish seemed to know she was there, however. They swam to the wall of the tank and stared out at her, goggle-eyed. Go away, she murmured as she checked over the dial. The pH was a little low, but everything else looked good. She moved to the junction station and tapped the acidity indicator, watching as the yellow numbers changed to a more acceptable level. That done, she moved to the opposite side of the tank, where the pipes led out into the aquarium. A set of gates inside would periodically open, letting roughly 80,000 pounds of fish through into the whale's tank every day. The pipes were clear, the pressure that would push the fish gently into the aquarium at optimum. Computer, everything looks good. I have noted that in the log, Kim. However, I think you may need to check on the engines today. There is something of note that will need to be visually sighted. Kim pulled herself back up the ladder. What is it? Nothing to be alarmed about, the computer replied. A valve in the fuel supply appears to be stuck. A valve? That shouldn't happen. Backup procedures are running now. As I said, it's not urgent, but I would advise a visual inspection before sending a droid in to repair it. Kim nodded. Yeah, why not? She hated going down to the engines. Not as much as the fisheries, but close. It was dirty, close, and hot on deck 15. She wished she could just send in a droid, but that would be cutting corners. And that was something she'd never in her life been able to bring herself to do. With a sigh, she peeled off the plastic suit and the boots, then the mask, and dumped them in the decontamination chest just outside the door. The Autobots would rehang them when they were done. She entered the spiraling ramp once more and began her descent. Again, nothing jumped out at her from the shadows. No strange figures lurked in the distance. She began to hum to herself, another of Constantine's wild, pounding rhythms. Computer, she began, as she rounded another pylon. Play? A sudden lurch of the deck threw her off her feet. 
The gravity that would have anchored her on Earth was lessened enough for her 112-pound body to smack into the pylon with a good deal of force. Kim felt the air rush out of her lungs long before she felt the pain of the impact. Crap! The ramp swayed under her as she dropped to her hands and knees. Whatever was happening, it wasn't over yet. The entire ship reeled to one side, and she began to slip. Her fingers scrabbled at the surface of the deck plates for purchase, but the holes were too small for her to put her fingers through. She knew she was heading closer to the railing and let out a pained squawk, all she could manage from her bruised lungs. The whales were panicking. Kim! 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 What's happening? Can't see. Everything's shaking. The water. The water. The fish are fleeing. Kim, I have detected unusual activity, the computer said. An alarm blared suddenly to life, and all the lights above the ramps suddenly brightened to full luminescence, making the place look glaring and two-dimensional, like cutouts in a diorama. Kim twisted her body, reaching out with one hand, preparing to grab at the railing as she slid past it. Her mind was already calculating the speed with which she'd need to take hold, the force with which she'd swing over the edge, and the possibility of neither measure being enough to keep her from plunging to her death in the chasm below. That's if she didn't hit one of the other ramps first. Kim, are you all right? Are you injured? What's happening? What's happening? But just as her body reached the edge of the ramp, the ship shuddered and groaned, tilting back the other way. At first it felt like she was merely going to be thrown toward the opposite rail instead, but Seiki mercifully evened out, and Kim found herself splayed on the floor, gasping for breath. Computer, she wheezed, pulling an arm across her ribs, several of which felt broken, and tucking her knees under her. Report. Gathering data. Please wait. A brief pause. Status report. Fire on the upper port engine nacelle. Repeat. Fire has been detected. Engines disengaged. Section quarantined. Kim, Kim, Kim. Open the hatches. Kim gasped as she pulled herself to her feet. There was a junction station around here somewhere. Where was it? She spied it just ahead, bolted to a pylon. In an emergency situation, junction stations came on automatically without the need for a kanji to activate them. Thank God. She didn't have to release the arm over her ribs to tap at the display. Vent it, damn you! Hatches are open. Fire is venting now. A droid whizzed down at her, beeping an alarmed greeting. Kim groaned. A goddamned medbot was all she needed right now. I'm not injured, she told it. But the tentacled droid came at her anyway hovering two feet in the air as it ran a scan over her, bleeping obscenely at what it found. Treatment required, it intoned. No treatment, she told it. I'm fine. Several injuries detected. Please lie back. The droid unfolded a hydraulic arm that spread out in a fan, creating a small, narrow stretcher. Get lost, Kim snapped. I've got too much to do. Kim, the computer said, the tone of chastisement evident in its voice. You are required to comply with the medbot's assessment. The medbot's wrong, computer. You want me laid up in bandages, or you want me to check out the damage on this thing? Gathering data, please. The computer cut itself off. There is no immediate requirement for a visual inspection. Please submit to the medbot. No. Computer, I'm in the middle of something. Shut the hell up for a moment. Kim had finally got the display up for the camera on the upper port side. For a moment, what she saw confused her. Nothing. Well, not nothing, exactly. She was looking down the side of the ship, crisp and clear gray, reflecting the light of distant stars, she could make out each section of curved hull plating. It was a cigar-shaped torpedo of reinforced steel, 
arrowing into the blackness of space. She could see the name painted on its side. Seiki. What the fuck? She couldn't hold back the curse. She checked the display. Upper port side, rear elevation. It read in yellow lettering beneath the view. She toggled up the labels. Yellow lines appeared. Drive vent, access hatch 315, intake valve. Each of the words hovered over sections of the ship. The words engine nacelle floated above it, at a distance that translated to a few feet above the hull. The line pointed at nothing at all. Kim, what's happening? The shaking stopped. Are we all right? Computer, she said. Show me the upper port side, rear elevation. The computer beeped. The display flickered, then came back just as it had been. Computer, this is not the upper port side, she said. This is a different camera. It's facing forward toward the prow of the ship. This is the camera for the rear upper port side, the computer confirmed. That's insane. I'm looking at the Seiki's name for God's sake. You can't see the name from the camera mount of the rear upper side. It's set behind the halfway point and facing rearwards. This is the camera for the... The computer hiccuped, cutting itself off. Fire has been vented. Situation is under control. Initializing scans for damage. Please stand by. Kim tapped the fingers of her free hand against her thigh. The ache in her chest was fading, but that could just be adrenaline. Her mind chewed over the problem frantically. It looked like the camera had been installed to face the front instead of the rear. But how could that happen? This was a multi-million dollar ship the pride and joy of Near Horizon and all unificationists. There had never been a mission like this one, not in human history. There was no way someone would have let this slip past the Space Exploration Authority's inspections. She brought up the controls to move the camera. She panned left, but the camera stopped before showing her the rear of the ship. She panned back the other way. No luck there either. 180 degrees was all she got. She tapped back, pulling up the rear uppermost camera. It showed the graceful tail fins of the ship, two pillars rising upwards a few hundred feet. The trail of smoky propellant was visible in a curved candle flame shape beyond them. She moved the camera to the right in a sweep, but the angle of the ship's hull prevented her from seeing the port side. She could see trailing wisps of smoke, however, and was that a faint imprint of charred metal? Just at the lip there? Kim, why aren't you speaking? Please tell us everything's all right. We're so worried. Kim, Kim, Kim. Initial scans complete, the computer told her. Damage is minimal. My analysis suggests that an undetected meteor struck the hull, puncturing one of the fuel storage units. The malfunction was caused by the fuel shutoff valve failing to initialize. The xenol ignited instead of being drawn back into the engine as the failsafe should have ensured. Kim sighed and felt herself relax. You told me the fuel valve wasn't urgent. At the time, it was not. The computer hesitated for a beat longer than Kim expected. This was my error. Right, she said. I'm going down to check out the damage myself. She glared at the medbot, which waited with its bed still stretched out invitingly. Kim, however, had no desire to lie down. I'll go to the infirmary afterwards. Then I want to take a look at that camera. There are no issues with any of the cameras. Kim did not protest, but neither did she agree. Yes, the camera might have somehow slipped past the authorities' inspections. But why would it be reading forward sections of the ship as if they were engine parts? There was something majorly wrong with a camera that identified systems that were not there. No, that was something that had to be looked at. 
because the only way that could happen was if someone had done it deliberately. She just had no idea why. Chapter 10 Thankfully, as the computer had said, the damage was minimal. The fuel cell had vented its precious cargo of xenol into space, but as each cell only contained a thirtieth of the methane-based fuel stores, and the engine itself manufactured more as it went, the loss of one cell's worth was not a major blow. Still, Kim had to crawl through several hundred feet of tight, winding tubes before she could check it out herself, and with her ribs and her other injuries becoming rapidly more apparent the further she went into the constricted spaces, it was a hard task. She'd wrenched her arm badly, and her ribs hurt terribly with every breath. Still, she forced herself to go on. If there was major damage and she didn't find it now, she could be dooming herself and the whales. Kim had managed to calm them, but she could still feel their unease coursing through her. It's fine, she said to herself. In the past, your ancestors would have lived through earthquakes. This was just like one of those. But what if it happens again? What if it's worse next time? It's unlikely that a meteor would hit the ship without being detected. This was partly a lie. Space was full of debris, dust-sized, fist-sized, basketball-sized, and bigger. It was only the larger pieces that were any threat. Usually. This one had been about the size of a human head, the type of which normally glanced off the hull without any problems. This one was only small, and must have hit at precisely the right angle and velocity. Just a fluke, really. It never would have damaged the life support sections. We're too heavily shielded. The damaged valve was repairable, she decided, looking it over with her flashlight clamped between her teeth. She couldn't examine the fuel cell itself without an EV suit or by using a tech droid, but the clear window in the tube's firewall showed that the hole was small. The meteor had glanced off rather than becoming lodged in the hull. It wouldn't take long to repair, and it was not an urgent job. Kim made her way back to the ramp and began the slow climb back up to deck four, where the infirmary was. A ship with one passenger didn't require a formal sickbay, so this was just a room with a relaxation chair that offered massages. Kim had never tried it and a few shelves full of medical equipment, creams, lotions, and pills. She tipped several painkillers into her hand and swallowed them dry, then grabbed a tablet scanner from a rack. She waved it over her chest. The readout showed bruising, but no fractures or breaks. Whatever, she said, disgusted not only with the results, but with her own inability to cope with the pain. She'd broken ribs several times on various jaunts in her life, pre-ARC project. They were listed in Hannah's medical file as horse riding accident, fall from monkey bars, speed racing injury. In reality, the majority of them had been caused by getting the crap kicked out of her by someone she'd crossed, or someone bigger and stronger than her that either hadn't seen her gang tat, or someone that had but had enough of a grudge against Constantine to risk his wrath by leaving her bleeding. She'd grown soft. The tablet advised her to use one of the bone regenerators and directed her to their locations. She waved the end over the left side of her chest and felt the repair begin to work. The pain faded little by little until it was the dull ache of a fortnight old injury. Then the regenerator shut off, informing her the major damage had been mended her body would have to heal the rest on its own time. She did the same with her shoulder and the faint red marks that would become bruises on her shins. That done, she felt suddenly exhausted. Computer, what are the chances of me going to bed right now? You will have to wake for your report to Edgeward Station in two hours' time. Of course I will, she said with a sigh. There was no point in heading to her room to sleep. She would be too edgy, and it would only make things worse when she was pulled out of bed for her report. But one thing was clear when she stood up. 
she wouldn't be doing any more work today. She ached all over, despite the regeneration, and she was woozy. Her head felt fuzzy, her thoughts blurred slightly at the edges. Suddenly, one flicker through her mind stood out amongst the rest. Adonai. It began as a slight concern for his safety, probably egged on by the slight agitations she still felt coming through the link from the whales. She had checked the link several times to make sure he hadn't been injured at all, and he did not appear to be. But the droid could have been damaged in the shaking of the ship. She made her way along the corridor to the mag lifts and hit the button to take her down to deck five. As the mag lift hummed into motion, another thought struck her. What if he had, somehow, been responsible for the valve malfunction? By the time she stepped into the corridor, she was almost certain of it. The timing was too perfect to be coincidental. She stopped in front of the storeroom door and saw the droid sitting on the floor by the wall. He raised his head when he saw her. Kim, he exclaimed. Thank the stars you're all right. What a strange expression he'd used. Thank the stars. Kim licked her dry lips. Something wet touched her face, and she lifted her hand, her fingers coming away tipped with blood. She must have missed a cut. You're hurt, he gasped, concerned. He stood, unfolding his body and hurrying toward the door, where he stopped just before the force field. You've injured yourself. Don't worry, she replied. I fixed the worst of it. This is just a bit of blood. Adonai looked at her sincerely. Kim, did you do this? She asked him. I, I beg your pardon? Did you tamper with the fuel valve? When you were wandering around the ship? Of course not, he said. He sounded genuinely shocked. I didn't touch anything I didn't need to. How can I be sure of that? Kim asked. Because there's something else that's weird, too. There's a camera that's mounted incorrectly. I didn't touch anything, he replied. I don't know what those things are, but they sound important. I promise you, I wouldn't have interfered with anything. He was pleading with her like a child accused of stealing the last biscuit. She fixed her gaze on him levelly, but couldn't hold it long. Her head was pounding and her joints aching. She had to look away. If you're lying to me, I wouldn't, Adonai protested frantically. Please believe me, I can't lie. I don't know how. Kim's gaze snapped back up to his. You don't know how? Adonai shook his head slowly. You've told me about lies, but have I ever told you one? Kim scoffed. How about... She waved a hand through the air, indicating the droid's body. That. That was not a lie, Adonai said softly. It was a deception. But if you had asked me, at any time, if I was planning this, I would have told you. Lies are different. Deliberate. I understand how they work, but I can't seem to tell them. And I have tried. I attempted to lie to you on several occasions. You did? Kim was astounded. She had known Adonai's intelligence was as much emotional as it was cognitive, but the extent had not quite registered. He had tried to lie. Why? I wanted to see what it was like. I wanted to be, to see what it was like to be human. Kim took a step backward, her shoulder blades meeting the bulkhead. She slid down until she was sitting on the floor, knees drawn up to her chest. She sighed and closed her eyes. Kim, are you all right? Adonai said, anxiously. Did I say something wrong? No, Kim replied. No. She lapsed into silence 
staying where she was for a very long time. A whale who wants to be human? This is definitely not what Kim signed up for. And while Adonai is her friend, can she really trust him? Because someone mounted that camera the wrong way. And there are definite signs that she's not alone on board. Who can Kim trust? Tune in for the next episode for more. So, don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. Tune in to hear all of our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you! Camcat Unwrapped also offers other Camcat books as podcasts. Also check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms, and our background episodes, where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to Camcat Unwrapped, because Camcat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.